This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre, the University of South Australia and ABC Friends to our event, Criminalising Journalism, Silencing Whistleblowers, Your Right to Know. Tonight we will hear from journalist, broadcaster and author Quentin Dempster AM as he explores why press freedom is under such pressure. I would like to thank Quentin for his time and contribution to tonight's discussion and to thank Wendy Parsons and the committee of ABC Friends for their work in making tonight's event possible. This event is being recorded and a video will be available on the Hawke Centre website. We encourage you to bring this to the attention of friends and colleagues who could not join us online tonight. It is now my pleasure to welcome Professor Rick Saar, UniSA Justice and Society, who will introduce Quentin Dempster. Thank you. Welcome, Quentin. I'm delighted that we can have this conversation together. It's uh, a pleasure to have you, uh, albeit electronically, but I'm sure that uh, the audience will enjoy uh, the discussion we're going to have and the answers you can give. Let me start with this first question about media freedom. It's obviously an important topic to you. Uh, what uh, drove you to this particular position to take a stance today? I've been a journalist uh, all my life, uh, all my working life, and uh, of course uh, I've been involved in journalist issues, uh, ethical issues, uh, all the contentious uh, uh, issues involving Australian journalists uh, for a long time. Uh, but uh, latterly, Rick, it's uh, <laughs> the devastation of the people of Hong Kong. I've been, they've been on the streets because Xi Jinping and the break your bones authoritarianism of uh, the Chinese Communist Party is making them confront the loss of their democratic freedoms in Hong Kong. So uh, that, as well as other incidents that we'll talk about, uh, has made me look at uh, of what is going on in our country and in the, the, the so-called five eyes, the Western democracies that uh, have a security arrangement. I've never done uh, national security reporting. <laughs> I've been in grubby corruption uh, reporting for a, a long time domestically, but uh, the issues are, are much broader now. Speaking internationally, of course, the, the big case that's been dominating the headlines in the last little while, or for a number of years now, of course, is the fate of the Australian Julian Assange. You have spoken passionately about his plight. Uh, tell us about your, uh, your thoughts on where that is going at the moment and how Australia might be affected by that. As uh, most people following it know that Julian Assange is uh, in Belmarsh Prison has gone through uh, the extradition hearings before a judge alone in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom government hasn't stood in the way of the US extradition uh, procedures uh, and uh, Assange is uh, uh, controversial, contentious because he has uh, grossly breached United States and uh, Five Eyes uh, security through, um, uh, through publishing, uh, through his organisation WikiLeaks, uh, highly classified information which has embarrassed uh, uh, all the democracies. Uh, it's uh, contentious because a lot of journalists uh, believe that uh, Assange is an anarchist. Uh, I've looked uh, further at that, and although he's uh, he certainly got uh, views about neoliberalism and and uh, and Western uh, security overreach, uh, he's certainly conscientious, uh, Rick, because uh, he's published uh, uh, the the WikiLeaks files, uh, which indicates the. Uh, the theme of his uh, of his exposure exposure journalism. So, in my view, it makes him a, a journalist, and uh, therefore he should uh, he should be supported. 
As I understand it, the extradition hearing has been uh, has been completed. The judge now has the matter before her. She's obviously uh, poring over the notes as to which way she's going to go. I won't ask you to predict that because I don't think anyone can predict where that's going to go at the moment. But let's say he's extradited to the United States and he's charged with espionage and those other things. It would seem to me a likely outcome that uh, he'll be found guilty and may face uh, a, a lengthy time in prison. If that is the case, I don't quite understand where the First Amendment comes in in relation to American uh, freedom of speech. Has that made uh, sense to you? Well, when you look at the extradition proceedings, Rick, uh, what the Americans have done is try to expand uh, the the scope of the affidavit to include uh, Assange's alleged criminality, not just the publication of the leaked material uh, from uh, uh, now it's acknowledged uh, Chelsea Manning, not just that material, but that he had uh, gone into criminal activity in uh, in hacking uh, US intelligence material and soliciting the hacking of that material. So that was a criminal act, not an act of uh, uh, politics, as it were, of publication. Uh, that is being argued before the judge. And even if the judge finds that the extradition of Assange is warranted, there will be an appeal. So this will go on and on and on. The, the people concerned about his human rights, particularly with the constriction of his, of his uh, activities in Belmarsh uh, prison, are desperately worried that uh, the, the trauma and psychological impact uh, could... Uh, could give him suicidal tendencies, particularly if he's extradited. That's and he'd be, he'd be jailed for life. Let's bring it back to the Australian context. I'll come to some specific cases later, but uh, I'd like to pursue the idea that we may want to go down the path as Australians of having a kind of an American style First Amendment right of free speech through a Bill of Rights. Uh, there's been a suggestion that that would be very useful in a similar circumstance, but what you're saying is that once you deal with state secrets and once you deal with particularly uh, Five Eyes style intelligence, uh, the Bill of Rights might be just uh, a piece of paper. Yes, but uh, we've had a long debate about a Bill of Rights in Australia, and I noticed uh, uh, Bob Carr, the Premier of New South Wales, who used to be opposed for, to it, saying we've got an electoral system, we've got separation of powers, uh, we've got a parliamentary system, uh, and uh, issues of human rights can come up and be dealt with accordingly, particularly uh, as Carr had been <laughs> targeted because of his uh, links with China. Uh, and a cloud placed over him, he's now starting to say, well, he needs some human rights as well. So that, just to put one side, that there is an ongoing human rights uh, or Bill of Rights uh, argument in Australia. Some of the states have got a, a Bill of Rights uh, already to protect human rights. The freedom of the media or press freedom is, an, is another issue. And that's why after the raids on Annika Smithhurst and the ABC, uh, media freedom has finally got up to the, uh, a high prominence in, a, in the Australian debate. Just uh, your role as a journalist and thinking about your, uh, your peers, uh, there's been a suggestion that the press has not been that sympathetic here in Australia to Assange. You'd think that being an Australian citizen, he would have garnered some degree of sympathy, but the press has been pretty hard on him. Uh, and appropriately so in that sense. Uh, yes, I, there was scepticism about him. I think uh, a lot of journalists were uh, uh, upset that uh, over the Hillary Clinton emails, but I've pointed out that he's not being extradited to the US on the Clinton emails, which is supposed to have uh, undermined uh, Clinton's uh, uh, election campaign in uh, 2016. He's been, he's been extradited because of the, the uh, WikiLeaks and the Chelsea Manning material, the, the, uh, the war logs, the Iraq war logs. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a lot of journalists now have come round to the view that uh, this is so important for journalism in Australia and worldwide and for the liberal democracies that uh, they have to come out and support him. So what was scepticism? A healthy scepticism has come round now to we must ensure that uh, Julian Assange is not extradited and he can be returned to Australia. Now, leaving to one side whether Julian Assange is a journalist or not, and that's been uh, a great deal of uh, debate has been around that particular issue, he's certainly a whistleblower. Now, I want you to take us to whether or not Australia's whistleblowing legislation, as I understand it, there's whistleblowing legislation in every jurisdiction, 
Um, but I don't know one whistleblower who's ever had a good experience coming out of that. Now clearly journalists find so much material in relation to investigative journalism from whistleblowers. What might you say about whistleblowers protections generally in Australia? The organisation Whistleblowers Australia has a very good analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of uh, protected disclosure laws in uh, the state jurisdictions and uh, now the Commonwealth. And what they seem to be saying, Rick, is that uh, uh, there, there is uh, <laughs> the whistleblower's lot is not a good one. Uh, anybody informing and being exposed as an informant to a journalist of embarrassing and uh, material uh, is in, in dangerous territory. Uh, that's why journalists have to be very careful about how you handle your informant and you risk manage it, as it were. But on your point about the law, the Whistleblowers Australia seems to be saying that uh, if you don't follow their rule and make your disclosure to your employer or the institution that you're blowing the whistle on, uh, they can come after you, and they have, for you going outside that, those rules. Basically, they want to keep it inside <laughs> inside the organisation. They don't want the, the sunlight of exposure. So that's a, a deficiency uh, of that. And it, it goes to the broader issue about what a liberal democracy should do as far as transparency, even in national security issues that uh, a lot of uh, classified information that want that has to be kept secret. We have to argue, why should it be kept secret? Why shouldn't it be transparent, particularly as we're trying to demonstrate that liberal democracies is wor are worth fighting for in an age of uh, authoritarianism? And indeed, uh, I think you're correct in saying, in fact, I know you're correct in saying that uh, the journalists who hear from whistleblowers are not typically the sorts of persons the legislation wants you to report to. So it becomes, as you say, a little bit of a, uh, uh, a catch-22 that you might want to blow the whistle on someone who is actually someone uh, to whom you need to report that, uh, that incident. So would, you, would it be better if the law were to actually bring journalists into that frame as a person to whom a whistleblower can go and still accept uh, the, the, uh, the consequences of that, that indeed the journalist then doesn't have to reveal their sources, of course, um, and governments would, would find them out of control in that regard? Uh, there is, is uh, a lot of benefit in going down that track, but uh, I, I know you're going to ask me questions about the Media Freedom Act. I think that would cover that situation, and uh, it requires a, a great piece of uh, uh, legislation and its definitions on, on uh, press freedom, and therefore uh, the, the, the avenue for whistleblowers to go public uh, in matters clearly in the public interest. OK, we'll come to the media freedom proposed legislation a bit later. That'll tie in whistleblowers, it'll tie in shield laws. It'll be quite uh, an interesting discussion before we finish today. One more specific question. A number of jurisdictions have now passed laws to fill a gap in relation to people who were going onto properties by stealth in order to photograph what they believed was animal cruelty. Uh, and to the extent that there was a gap in the legislation to say that that really had been protected in the past in the public interest. What do you say about those laws that have been passed to criminalise that behaviour? The same thing. I, 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 as a journalist, I suppose, what uh, the judgment of the journalist is, is this uh, value in publishing that uh, that material, but everybody's a journalist now, Rick. <laughs> Everybody, because you, we, we're publishing this now. Uh, uh, we're posting this video. Anybody can post some video. Now, there's great argument about uh, uh, inappropriate uh, video content, uh, very damaging, and so there has to be some regulatory control and limits on uh, the publication when it's clearly dangerous to the public. Um, um, in, a, in an age of terror, uh, jihadi terror, white supremacy terror, uh, you're going on about, um, you asked me about animal cruelty. Yes, of course, the internet can, is flooded with animal cruelty pictures uh, and video. We know about that. Uh, to, but to go onto a, a property and, uh, and take uh, illegally uh, uh, animal cruelty videos, well, you take your risk. Uh, it's it's you're, you're trespassing on property, and uh, I'm sure governments want to protect the cattle industry and uh, uh, and uh, animals generally. But uh, uh, it is a it is a risk, and the criminal law should apply uh, only appropriately.
we're talking about public interest here. So I don't know enough about that, Rick, uh, to see whether the legislation that, that has been carried is what could be called overreach. I don't know. That's a nice uh, segue, Quentin, into a bit more of a broader discussion now about Australian security and security secrets and the line between governments hanging on to their secrets and not being embarrassed. I want you to take us back to 2003 when Laurie Oakes and Andrew Wilkie had their first uh, meeting. Uh, tell us about that and how that unfolded in relation to a chain of events to do with Andrew Wilkie's leaking of, of a whole range of matters. Well, you'll remember that uh, there's a great uh, distress in Australia about uh, uh, our involvement with the United States in uh, the Iraq uh, war. Uh, and the, the argument was from all the security agencies of the, the Five Eyes about that Iraq, uh, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, in spite of the fact that the weapons inspector Hans Blick said they no longer did have weapons of mass destruction. And uh, all the security agencies in the world were about to send Australian young men and women in our defence forces into harm's way. Wilkie, a, 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 an intelligence official, an analyst, uh, was distressed about that. Uh, he left a note in Laurie Oakes's uh, letterbox at his Canberra home and said, I want to talk to you. He resigned. He resigned rather than be uh, involved in a, what was a deception of the, of the public, and he went public. He didn't leak material. He conscientiously resigned. Uh, I'm pleased to say he's now an independent member of parliament and he's done some very great work as an independent uh, on that, and uh, he, is a, he is an advocate for transparency, e including from security agencies to the extent necessary. Not operationally, of course, but to the extent necessary to explain to the public what's really going on. So Laurie was on the <laughs> was on the uh, Walkley board at the time when the Walkley's, Walkley Foundation gave WikiLeaks a Walkley Award for outstanding contribution to journalism. Uh, Laurie was you know, sceptical about uh, about Julian Assange, as many of us uh, were, but believed that uh, WikiLeaks had established a new method of getting material out to the public uh, and material that the public had a right to know, particularly as countries were being engaged in war and invasive war uh, on, on very questionable intelligence. So it becomes an issue of the transparency of intelligence uh, material to their publics. If, we're not, if we live in a, a liberal democracy, that's what it's all about. Now, you've mentioned the phrase five eyes uh, a number of times. This, of course, is a conglomeration of intelligence agencies. Just to remind our listeners uh, who are in the five eyes. USA, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand. And they obviously share intelligence as part of a, uh, an alliance. Is that the way in which it works? Yes, they do. And now with, uh, with the metadata and uh, uh, mass surveillance, which had been <laughs> exposed as unconstitutional by the conscientious American employee, uh, Edward Snowden, everybody is well aware of the, what we are now in is the surveillance state. And uh, surveillance uh, to protect us, you could say, is a very good thing. Everybody wants to contribute. We could all ring a 1-800 number to help uh, ASIO and uh, the domestic uh, uh, anti-terror agencies about what's really going on domestically. But also there's an obligation on the security agencies to develop transparency and trust for the publics of the five eyes. And I don't think that's happening. There's very uh, severe action through prosecutions. Assange is one. A lot, of, a lot of the prosecutions domestically indicate that they've got, the, they've got the wrong end of the stick if you're talking about maintenance of the values of a liberal democracy. Um, speaking of Laurie Oakes, um, the name Oakes, of course, uh, reminds me of Dan Oakes, and I'm assuming that uh, the charges that have been brought against him were not sufficient uh, such that the charges were dropped in a prosecution recently. Can you tell us something about that matter? The charges were sufficient. <laughs> they were sufficient, but the Director of Public Prosecutions, Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, determined to our great relief that uh, it would not be in the public interest to, to charge Oakes. Oakes is a journalist for the ABC, and remember they published the, uh, uh, the An Afghan files, uh, the first instances of, uh, of atrocity in Afghanistan. 
by Australian soldiers. So uh, it was it was really touch and go there because that was part of the uh, raids by the Australian Federal Police on uh, the ABC officers uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, but Oakes, he was going to be uh, they, uh, after after the search warrant, he was go- was charged with unlawfully receiving military information contrary to the Defence Act, maximum penalty unlimited, and or dishonestly receiving stolen Commonwealth property contrary to the Defence Act, uh, the, contrary to the Criminal Code, maximum penalty 10 years. I think what that, what's happened here, in, particularly since 9-11, and all the security uh, legislation, 82 pieces of security legislation been passed in Australia, there's been a view by our security agencies that they're going to have to clamp down and send a rocket, as Scott Morrison would say, into journalists trying to expose what was going on. And they had to be very clear about maintaining the secrecy and classified, of classified information. So there's been a, a, an overreach by the intelligence agencies, and that was, became apparent uh, particularly through the uh, raids on uh, Annika Smethurst and uh, the ABC. Now, following those raids on Annika Smithhurst's home and the ABC offices, uh, if I recall, the Attorney General Christian Porter, I think under some pressure uh, in Parliament, made some comment that he would be seriously disinclined to continue with the prosecution if a journalist were involved. Does that give you some heart or do you think that's just fluff? The journalists of Australia were very grateful to the Attorney General for making that clear, particularly those uh, journalists who were, had been uh, charged or were going to be charged and faced uh, imprisonment. Uh, but uh, that's, that's just one attorney general. The point at issue is, as we've been discussing, the, uh, the public interest journalism that is, should be practised in a liberal democracy and, and the protections of, of uh, the media and journalists uh, from prosecution. So it, uh, uh, we're grateful that uh, the DPP is not uh, charging Dan Oakes and we're grateful for the attorney having made that statement that he'd be disinclined, but it still leaves the possibility of, uh, and the chilling effect, as we call it, the chilling effect of the raids on journalists' uh, offices in Australia and their potential uh, for prosecution. Which brings us nicely to a matter that has not gone away, and that's one which I think has been on everyone's lips, certainly for the last couple of years, of uh, Bernard Caleri. And I should remind uh, listeners that some years ago, Bernard Caleri, in fact, was the, uh, the Attorney General for the ACT. So he's no slouch when it comes to uh, legal matters and governmental matters. In fact, he's been acting in a private capacity as a lawyer for some years. And indeed, in defending uh, so-called Witness K, he found himself on the wrong side of the prosecution. So what's happening with Witness K and Bernard Caleri from a journalist's point of view, Quentin? That's not a f- press freedom issue so much, but it's a, an issue of the what I've been discussing, of the overreach of the security agencies, in my view. So uh, uh, there's been a great deal of public support for Bernard Caleri and Witness J. Uh, if anybody's interested, you can... Read uh, Bernard's excellent book. Uh, I, I'm not being paid by the publisher, I, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, but uh, Oil Under Troubled Waters. And you remember it was the Australian security agencies bugging the uh, cabinet officers of the East Timor, uh, our country, which we've helped to uh, liberate uh, many years ago. Uh, it was bugging that office, uh, not for our national security, but for our uh, financial advantage through the, uh, the assets uh, in the Timor Sea. Uh, and Bernard Caleri was uh, uh, representing uh, Witness J and uh, and prosecuting that, uh, well, defending himself uh, through that when the security agencies raided Bernard Caleri and the prosecution occurred. Uh, I, again, again, I think it's overreach by the security agencies because they they basically very aggressively saying, "You you you cross us and we will prosecute you." And uh, um, that is now being played out through the courts. And and what's distressing again, Rick, is the secrecy around that prosecution and the trial of Bernard Cleary and Witness J. I I should uh, point out to listeners, and you can um, take this uh, as a question as well, that for the most part, um, we have open court proceedings in Australia. That's part of a robust democracy. And a journalist who makes a, uh, an accurate report, so long as it's not actuated by malice, 
an, act, an accurate report of whatever happens in court is completely at liberty to publish that material. As I understand it, lots of things happening in the courts in relation to this particular matter and even the David McBride, McBride matter are, uh, are in closed courts. Is that your understanding? How do journalists cope with that? I think the only thing the journalists can do is point out when the lid comes down uh, and that they cannot publish material and give the context of the prohibition on the publication. And uh, the public then is aware that uh, something is not quite right. And as you say, what we all expect and hope to be open courts. Uh, there can be instances where courts uh, can be closed for uh, safety of uh, individuals. Everybody could understand that, but there must be clear uh, delineation and explanation by the courts and judicial officers themselves. If we, if we live by the separation of powers, uh, the judicial officers themselves should be very wary about uh, closing courts, uh, um, particularly when, uh, uh, when so much is at stake for, for the individuals and the broader public. I want to take you uh, back to the United States for the moment. This, of course, is a debate that's been going on there since the Pentagon Papers were published. Uh, and then through uh, the 1980s, you'll recall Ronald Reagan uh, saying, it's all a bit secret here, but if you knew what I knew, then, uh, then you wouldn't be broadcasting this material as well. We'll come to the Media Freedom Act a bit later. We're getting to it. We're, bu we're building up to it. But I just want to take you back to the Pentagon Papers and what we may have learned from the American experience in relation to these matters. When I was looking at the Julian Assange case and uh, went back to see what uh, the American First Amendment was all about, that was freedom of the press, and looking at the great precedent of the Pentagon Papers uh, uh, in the 1970s, uh, with the Nixon administration. And uh, I came across what is now uh, well known in American history, but not known so well in Australian history. The, the judge who had uh, heard the uh, application by the Nixon administration for a, an injunction against the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, basically rejected the injunction. And he said these words, Judge Gerfine, a, a district uh, a judge, he said, the security of the nation is not at the ramparts alone. Security also lies in the value of our free institutions. A cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press must be suffered by those in authority to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. Now, the Nixon administration took that further to the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court by six votes, six judges to three, uh, endorsed that uh, judge's ruling and the New York Times and the Washington Post were then free to publish without any change all the Pentagon Papers or all the material that they thought was relevant to the public interest of the United States. So there you had the First Amendment precedent of freedom of the press. And Daniel Ellsberg, who had given the material, the Pentagon Papers, to the Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, was not... A, a traitor. He didn't sell the secrets of the United States to the enemies of the United States. Uh, he put it to the journalists and these great newspapers and published it. And it showed the, the, the United States administration through various administrations back to Kennedy had systematically deceived the American people about the motivation for the Vietnam War and the justification for the Vietnam War. And before his death, most movingly, uh, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defence with Kennedy and Johnson, said, uh, we made a mistake. One of the, Time magazine, one of the biggest apologies uh, ever known, where Bob, Mac, Mac, Bob McNamara said, we made a mistake. Vietnam was a failure of our policy judgment. We should not have been there. And uh, he said, we, we owe it to future generations to explain why. And when I read all that, I thought, yes, uh, if security and intelligence is not transparent as much as possible about the motivations for war, for war, for heaven's sake, uh, we, we are missing something very serious about it. So uh, I, I'm, I'm like you, we're all grown up after the Second World War, uh, but uh, my father was a, uh, uh, was a soldier in Palestine and, the, uh, and New Guinea and uh, told me about the horrors of that war justified war and, and those occasions. But since the Second World War, we've been led into various wars 
by, by misguided intelligence. And that is very distressing. And that's why we should have a debate about the transparency and secrecy, the, the, the argument about transparency versus secrecy, operational secrecy of intelligence agencies, particularly if we want, if we want to tell Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party is this is the way you run a, a democracy and this is the value of it by comparison to your authoritarian model. Admittedly, very clever uh, economically, but your authoritarian model. Well, just tangentially, of course, we come forward to the uh, the Trumpian uh, period, where indeed the uh, the press is now the enemy of the people. That must strike uh, a stake in the heart of many journalists across the United States. It's a challenge from uh, Donald Trump, and I'm pleased to see that the journalists and the news publications of the United States, with some exceptions, <laughs> like uh, uh, Rupert's uh, uh, Fox News, uh, the, the journalists and publications of the United States have uh, stepped up to that challenge with fact-checking and pointing out uh, the, the lies of the president of the United States. That's all playing out uh, in the, uh, the US presidential election now. Coming back to Australia, there is a joint parliamentary uh, committee inquiry, that's the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security, which I think we can be pleased to say is trying to find this balance between press freedom and the idea of national security and obviously keeping certain matters that might be jeopardising national security out of the public eye. Tell us a bit about that Joint Parliamentary Committee's inquiry and whether or not you have any faith in it uh, going forward. It came from the kerfuffle over the raids on uh, Annika Smethurst and the ABC, and uh, it was established uh, uh, by the, uh, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. And uh, I'm afraid it's, uh, it's a bit uh, weak, Rick. It's, uh, it's the, the Right to Know campaign set up by all the media organisations, the ABC News Corporation, Rupert's News Corporation and Nine and, and Seven West uh, Media had gone in to say, listen, if you're going to raid us, you've got, to, uh, you've got to allow us, because press freedom is uh, the argument here, you've got to allow us to uh, contest the, the justification for the search warrant. And uh, the security agencies and AFP say, "Well, we can't tip you off <laughs> or what we're looking for because you could hide the you could hide the evidence." Uh, what they've come up with is a uh, is a public interest advocate who would uh, uh, make the case in secret, as it were, uh, about the protection of the journalist sources before any raid went in. And this is hardly adequate to what we've been discussing. And that's why there's been a great deal of uh, pressure for a Media Freedom Act, which would try to enshrine in Australian law something very similar to the US First Amendment on freedom of the press and freedom of, uh, of uh, expression. Right, let's get to the media freedom uh, legislation, the kind of proposed legislation. How would it operate? How would you determine matters of public interest and who would make that determination? Um, that is a very good question. At, at the outset, it would recognise a free press was part of democratic accountability. Uh, all the things we've been talking about in uh, what should be the values of a liberal democracy, it would determine, it would really underwrite what should be the public's right to know. Uh, and of course, it's not absolute. Uh, the, the, um, this has to be defined. So it goes to the, it, it would have a, a great effect on the culture of uh, secrecy uh, and change that to one of uh, disclosure and transparency. Um, it would have what was called, I'm looking at my notes here, Rick, uh, an exemption uh, that um, would, that, that uh, public interest uh, journalism was excluded public interest publication was excluded from the scope of criminal offence. And uh, it goes down to the, it will have to go down to the fine definition of that so that journalists uh, uh, cannot be prosecuted for publishing material that, they, that may have come to them uh, illegally in the sense that a, that a whistleblower or an informant has breached uh, the security classification, as it were, or the confidentiality that uh, applies within an institution and gives it to the journalist. Um, it would exempt the, the journalist from being prosecuted. 
Uh, and overall, the Media Freedom Act would stop the, what we call the chilling effect of these heavy-handed prosecutions that have been going on in our country. Uh, the government uh, is not embracing that. Uh, the Scott Morrison government is not embracing that. Uh, it becomes a, a part of the debate in the, uh, in the future election campaigns. I've yet to see what the, uh, the opposition uh, says about that. Mark Dreyfus, the shadow attorney, uh, haven't heard him so far on a Media Freedom Act, but I'm, we're hoping that the, the opposition accepts it and it becomes part of the debate. Uh, and uh, that ScoMo, Scott Morrison and Christian Porter eventually move that way. I think, they, as we've discussed, when they've decided not to prosecute Dan Oakes, they think the media freedom issue will just die in Australia where we've handled that uh, on the 24-hour news cycle. No problem, uh, but there will be a great argument to be had uh, in an enlightened liberal democracy, we hope, like Australia, that we really do need a Media Freedom Act. So you're saying at the moment it's still uh, in a very draft form as part of the Right to Know campaign and uh, you're kind of asking parties to pick up and run with it. Once it is in some sort of final form, it could even be a private member's bill. But of course, if you don't have the support of one of the major parties, it'll just die in a ditch. We're hoping that uh, private uh, independent members, Andrew Wilkie, um, uh, Helen Haynes, others, uh, pick it up and get it into onto the uh, the notice paper of the parliament, and that will get it going. Uh, so I, I expect that it'll take a, a very long time to develop this. But uh, I go again to what I started with, the, the plight of the fine people of Hong Kong in fighting for their democratic rights, let alone press freedom, should really sharpen the focus of we here in Australia about what democratic freedoms actually are and what the benefit uh, of public interest journalism to those democratic freedoms actually is. Just going back to that question about who might make that determination about whether some particular matter is in the public interest such that it could be put in the public realm, would you put that in the hands of a judge or do you think this public interest advocate could do that role? Uh, inevitably, these things end up uh, ju in a justiciable form. That means it'll get before a judge uh, in, to be argued uh, on, the, on the fine definition. So uh, I've got no difficulty about uh, uh, the justiciability of that um, as long as we've got an independent judiciary, <laughs> which, is another, which is another bulwark of, uh, of a liberal democracy. An independent judiciary is important, a fair electoral system and uh, a free press. I should just say anecdotally, I think we do have a wonderful judiciary. We are blessed in relation to our democracy that in fact we can put faith in the judiciary at all levels. I'm quite amused about the fact that you can just about predict everything coming out of the United States Supreme Court on the basis of whether it's going to be a 5-4 decision. And now with this latest uh, appointment, everyone knows which way it's going to go on every matter. It's going to go 6-3. That, that makes a mockery of the law. It, it, it drives a stake in the heart of a good legalist like myself. But that's a bit of an uh, Well, uh, we, could, we could have a debate here about the appointment of judges. Uh, the, the, it's done, as you know, Rick, by uh, my state attorney general and uh, my, the Commonwealth attorney general having a discussion with the chief justice looking down the list of appropriate uh, people. And uh, it's a, sort of a gentleman's club, if you know what I mean. Is anything adverse about this one? Or yes, we need some more women on the bench. Uh, and it seems to have bipartisan uh, support uh, the appointment of judges. Uh, there is a big uh, kerfuffle or a dispute over the stacking of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which is distressing to me and I'm sure to you, Rick, uh, wanting to maintain the, uh, the, the integrity and independence of any judicial or, uh, or adjudicating uh, tribunal. So uh, we've got to watch the pollies like hawks <laughs> uh, if it comes to putting their, their favourites uh, onto the benches and point it out. I'm sure the legal profession in Australia, which is, by the way, I'm very grateful to the legal profession for helping journalists in the publication. I've been working with lawyers all my life as a journalist. As I don't want to put the ABC, when I work for the ABC, don't want to put the ABC at uh, all the taxpayers' money at risk before we go over and uh, kick this, uh, these buggers in the shins with what we've got. 
I've had great support from lawyers who are, are wonderful at determining uh, the, the public interest question and, uh, and the publication question uh, when, we, uh, when we publish things that uh, are really uh, distress uh, governments or corporations or individuals or institutions. I should say anecdotally, as you and the listeners will know very well, there are two appointments about to be made at the High Court given that two judges are about to retire. And anecdotally, uh, one of those considerations might be putting in a South Australian for the first time since 1903. We haven't had one at all, neither has Tasmania nor the Northern Territory for that matter. So that's what I'd be advocating for regardless of uh, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't comment on parochialism, uh, Rick. Uh, but, oh, uh, no, of course not. <laughs> uh, what, what we both agree on, I'm sure, is that the merit of, uh, yes, of course, there should be uh, 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 people coming from all areas of, of our mighty land, uh, but the, the key point is the, the merit of the appointment. Now, speaking of... Uh, uh, parochialism, I suppose we could put um, Kevin Rudd into, uh, into that category, as I'm sure you've read in the last week or so, and the listeners and viewers will know, uh, Kevin put up a, uh, an idea for a petition uh, to have a Royal Commission or some sort of commission of inquiry into uh, the, uh, the dominance, I think he called it the media dominance of News Corp. Uh, apparently it received 300,000 signatures uh, in a very short period of time. Do you have a view on whether or not uh, diversity of media plays into the media freedom? Uh, yes, it does, uh, particularly in Australia. I signed the petition, <laughs> Kevin's petition, and <laughs> I noticed that Malcolm Turnbull has also been critical of the undue influence of News Corporation and its outlets uh, in Australia. Malcolm's uh, also signed it. Uh, it, uh, it probably will never happen, but it raises the issue about uh, diversity, particularly now uh, after the consolidation, under Malcolm's uh, reign, by the way, Malcolm Turnbull's reign, uh, the consolidation of uh, the Fairfax newspapers into, into nine. Um, and um, uh, so we've got a, we've got a difficulty. Uh, there's a broader issue, of course, with the disrupted media, the sacking of thousands and thousands of journalists uh, over the last uh, 10 years because of the uh, Google and Facebook has taken the bulk of the advertising revenue. And so uh, that, it, it, that has to be played into uh, concerns about uh, media diversity. We want um, a subscriber-based media organisations, outlets right through Australia. But Rupert has really behaved uh, unethically uh, in the partisanship that is so obvious in his, uh, his newspapers uh, in Australia. And, um, and it's become so much so that uh, Kevin's not going to take it anymore, even though uh, he played up to Rupert when he was uh, campaigning to be Prime Minister of Australia. So everybody understands the uh, little bit of hypocrisy there. But uh, and, and likewise with Malcolm Turnbull, you always had to take into account how would Rupert handle this. And it's distorting in the sense that um, uh, it, uh, they target people uh, uh, they, they're, they're not fair in many occasions and, um, and it, uh, it becomes, again, undue, undue influence or distorted influence on what should be, we would hope in Australia, a smart, uh, enlightened and inclusive uh, media organisations who have one commitment only, all you want from the media is to tell the public what's really going on, what they have a right to know, not what the, uh, the Labor Party or the not targeting the Labor Party or targeting the Liberal Party or the National Party, but tell the public what is really going on. That's what this country deserves uh, from its media, not the media pa power play games that have uh, been pursued by, by Rupert over, uh, over all his lifetime in, uh, in dominance of Australian media. Have you formed a view, speaking of the idea of um, uh, Facebook and Google and Apple and others uh, basically pulling news from their services rather than have to pay the journalist for placing the news there? I, I'm a little confused about where that argument is going. Have you formed a view? I have, and uh, I think they should pay uh, because they get a benefit uh, from it. Uh, from the content that's created by people who are who are employing the journalists and all the operational staff uh, to produce news content, 
of public interest for Australia, including the ABC and, and SBS. Uh, they, they, Google and Facebook have made the point that these media outlets now in an internet world, they place, uh, they post all their material uh, up, some with paywalls, some for free, and uh, people click on it and they find it through Google search. They, the, these news organisations certainly get a benefit. But what's at stake here at the moment is the government's rev mandatory revenue sharing uh, legislation which will force Google and Facebook to offer a payment to uh, media outlets for the public interest material that they, that they cover, that they, they post, uh, and force them to pay because at the moment they don't want to pay. Now, if they withdraw from Australia, well, others will come in. I'm not frightened about that. Other search engines will come in uh, and, uh, and uh, if they meet an arrangement with uh, a, a fair arrangement with the people who are actually uh, employing the content creators. So uh, it's, a, it's a trade practices matter. It's a competition, consumer com competition matter. And uh, Rod Sims from the ACCC has uh, uh, done a worldwide search about that. And the mandatory revenue sharing code is the first of its kind in the world. That's being worked on by the by the ACCC and Josh Frydenberg and the Communications Minister Paul Fletcher at the moment. I think there'll be, there is bipartisan support for it, Rick, so it will change uh, the nature of uh, content payment. The media, media in Australia so desperately needs some support uh, because we're in a world of uh, uh, global interlopers, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say. Video streamers can come in and catch the eyeballs of Australia and not break any content here. Uh, and uh, create, uh, extract revenue from Australia. There should, I, I, I'm all for that. There's wonderful upsides to it. Wonderful that you can read the New York Times and the Washington Post every morning uh, or right through the busy 24-hour news cycle. Wonderful upsides to it, but there's also downsides for communities like 25 million people are stuck down here near the South Pole in Australia, which wanting to maintain a robust democracy uh, and with all the accountabilities that, uh, uh, that we need. Just going back to diversity for the moment, what do you say to those people who might say, well, actually, um, the whole idea of trying to break the, uh, the Murdoch or News Corp dominance is really just uh, tilting at windmills. Surely we've got such a diversity now that uh, young people particularly, I'm a baby boomer, you're a baby boomer, uh, we're talking about people who don't read newspapers anymore, they just have a massive diversity of stuff that's online. Is that an argument uh, away from the idea of challenging the Murdoch dominance? In that sense, uh, you're right. It is uh, wonderful diversity uh, through the digital revolution, and it will uh, it will continue. the The argument, I suppose, with Rupert uh, Murdoch's uh, outlets is undue domestic uh, uh, distortion and uh, unfair unfair uh, misuse of his uh, newspaper uh, and media outlets. Um, it's that it's that uh, real uh, contentious issue that is the part of the, the Royal Commission uh, campaign by Kevin Rudd and now Malcolm Turnbull. Um, uh, but you're right that uh, diversity can uh, save us. There's already substantial diversity. Uh, I don't want people to, to not uh, buy Rupert's uh, newspapers. I just want them to behave ethically and in a fair-minded way uh, with their reporting. I want uh, News Corporation and its outlets in Australia to survive. People said, Quentin, why don't you help us ban uh, Rupert? You know, uh, <laughs> stop buying the Herald Sun and uh, the Courier Mail uh, because of their unfair uh, coverage uh, and the unethical behaviour on their front pages and their targeting and what have you. I said, no, there are a lot of very good journalists in News Corporation uh, uh, suffering <laughs> as they do, but that, that's the proprietor who calls the shots. Uh, through his uh, appointed uh, editors, and uh, it's if we could just get them to behave ethically and in a fair-minded way, we, of course we can have a robust discussion. By all means, get stuck into Dan Andrews or Gladys Berejiklian or uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk or Scott Morrison, but it has to be consistent and ethical and fair-minded. If we could only get them to that stage, News Corporation could continue to have a to make uh, play a much better role in Australian media. But we just want them to behave themselves. Quentin, in putting this topic uh, into the uh, the Hawke um, 
logo, we invited readers and, uh, and, and viewers to contribute to questions. We got dozens of responses and uh, I've interpolated, I think, most of them into the discussion we've been having for the last 50 or so minutes. But I've just got three questions which are completely unredacted that I've got at the end here, which have come from people who are invited to contribute questions. So I'll read them to you and we'll take them one at a time. The first one, what's your position on the role of the ABC in relation to this freedom of the press? Where's the ABC fit in all of this? Well, as you know, it's uh, integral to the diversity of, uh, of uh, our media and uh, it, uh, it's in a pretty rough spot uh, at the moment following defunding of deliberate policy of the Liberal National Party government. I, I say that uh, not to be partisan, but to point out that uh, the, the budgets have been cut in by Joe Hockey in 2014 and uh, uh, by Scott Morrison in, uh, in 2017. So the ABC is being defunded and it, uh, in its, its capacity to do all the things that the ABC Act requires of it across all the genres, not just news and current affairs, but uh, drama and documentary and uh, sport and uh, uh, rural and regional coverage has all been affected. And we need the ABC to survive through the digital revolution. The ABC has been a driving force in technological change from uh, AM, FM uh, to uh, multi-channel television in digital, now more with the distribution of content through the internet. Uh, if we want the ABC to survive as a balancing and diverse force in Australian media, it has to be adequately funded. And I know the board is in great distress and all the staff at the ABC are in great distress with what is happening and uh, are limiting its capacity. The trouble is, Rick, the ABC has been too successful in this sense that through the bushfires of 2019-20 and now the pandemic, the ABC is now at the highest level, well above News Corporation and Nine and Seven West Media and the Australian and everybody else. It's now uh, um, an industry leader in digital content distribution and news and current affairs uh, in particular. And uh, that's read, led to a resentment by News Corporation and, uh, and the Nine Entertainment about the ABC uh, being so uh, well represented in, in audience figures when they're trying to make a quid. I can understand, uh, make a quid out of the market. Uh, I can understand that. But at the same time, it indicates a great and profound trust by the Australian people for the ABC. So I'm distressed to see it distressed and it suffering from defunding. Uh, we want all the other um, paywall media providers to survive and to, and to have proper uh, subscription uh, benchmarks and uh, to be underwritten by their business plans. But it's still so vital that the ABC continue to play a major role in Australian media. A second question that comes from uh, a reader, a listener, viewer, is quality long form investigative journalism dead? Um, you've been around journalism for a very long period of time. What's your reading of the landscape over the last 20 or 30 years? Uh, no, no, investigative journalism is not dead, but it's constrained. And uh, as we've been discussing in this forum, the chilling effect of overreach by security agencies uh, is a continuing concern. But uh, the Four Corners and the ABC, uh, 60 Minutes uh, on, uh, on Nine, uh, other investigative programs and uh, journalists still exist. We're now in a situation where, as we've been discussing, people know how they can get material to journalists and for proper ethical judgments to be made about that material. Uh, the, with Google search, uh, everybody can find out how you risk manage getting material out to the public through accredited and, and properly resourced uh, investigative journalism outlet. So it's not dead. We need it more. It will go on. And final question, uh, Quentin, for our discussion today. How can the average citizen support the protection of independent ethical journalism in Australia? What's the role of us listening to you today? Well, like any ordinary ordinary member of the public, <laughs> uh, you, can, uh, you can become an activist and, uh, and join. 
as well as you can uh, with Twitter. Of course, everybody can have an outlet as well. There are lots of upsides with uh, the digital revolution, as we've been discussing. There are a lot of downsides with misinformation, fake news and what have you. But an informed citizen uh, can play a role uh, in uh, observ observing and uh, using the knowledge that that citizen has to engage with journalists and media outlets. I've had no difficulty through my career when people phoned or emailed me and said, Quentin, you've stuffed this up, or you missed that fact. Uh, why didn't you look at this? What's wrong with you? Uh, um, you made a mess of that. I've never worried about that sort of thing. I said, well, where, where have I gone wrong? You tell me what I should be doing and, and glean from that valuable information from your informant. So all members of the public are informants, uh, in, not, in a, not in a dire or nasty sense, but in a, in a good sense, you can tip us off. You can tip off journalists about what's going on and a good journalist will respond to genuine information. So it's a question of engagement and commenting now and uh, drawing attention to other things that the journalists and the media outlets are missing. That's been very valuable. And any journalist uh, knows, any good journalist knows that a good informant uh, with the information, not the documents necessarily, but the information that you should be aware of to inform the public is a good way for a citizen in a liberal democracy to uh, conduct him, himself or herself. Quentin, that's a marvellous uh, upbeat way for us to end today. I do want to thank you on behalf of all the people who would be uh, listening and tuning in today, if there was a, an applause button, I'd push it right now. Uh, but we've been uh, very grateful for you taking the time uh, with the discussion of the Media Freedom Act and where that's going to be going in due course. Uh, we've been watching you on the television for many, many years, and I can still read uh, the passion in your face and in your voice uh, to make sure that we actually have a great and broad and diverse uh, media and indeed a freedom of the media here in this country. So on behalf of all the listeners and uh, the Hawke Centre, of course, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you, Professor. And uh, thanks to the Hawke Centre and thanks, everybody. So my name is Sue Pinnock and I'm, a, I'm president of the Friends of the ABC in South Australia and Northern Territory. Criminalising journalism, silencing whistleblowers, your right to know is an initiative of ABC Friends SA. I would like to thank the Hawke Centre for facilitating this important conversation. The Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre program of events reflects the fundamental themes, strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity, building our future. This conversation certainly reflects the theme of democracy when freedom of the press and the role of journalists within democracy democracies has never been under such sustained attack, especially, it seems, from governments. What could have been more illuminating than hearing Quentin Dempster in conversation with Rick Saar? Quentin with his extensive background in journalism and Rick in the law, a perfect combination of insights to be had about this topic. We have been given a lot of context for this discussion. Details of the treatment of whistleblowers and those acting on their behalf to inform the public about state secrets. Quentin has alluded to the ramifications of the loss of media freedom on the willingness of whistleblowers to come forward and the subsequent effect on our right to know if journalists are not protected within legislation. In 1971, the United States Supreme Court decision on the Pentagon Papers upholding the First Amendment showed how freedom of the press is the protective shield of journalists and editors there. As Quentin has pointed out, Historic lessons for Australia to institute a Media Freedom Act urged by many journalists and media organisations, noticeably the ABC, News Corp, Nine Entertainment and Seven West have gained prominence. However, in this age of terror, the position journalists who deal with such information face is that of being criminalised. The justification being that the public has to be kept safe. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on intelligence and security continues to hold a, hold a hard line against search warrants involving journalists and media organisations being contestable. It seems that relying on the Attorney General being seriously disinclined to sign off on any prosecution of a journalist over a public interest question is not reassuring, nor is the idea of a public interest advocate. 
who could argue in secret about the public interest issues involved in the application for a search warrant served on a journalist or media organisation. The importance of a Media Freedom Act looms large. This conversation has helped us understand the complexity and current state of media freedom and the effect on our democracy if the media is not free and whistleblowers not protected. On behalf of the audience, the Hawke Centre and ABC Friends SANT, I would like to thank Quentin and Rick for an informative and forward-thinking discussion. Before I go, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about ABC Friends. ABC Friends organisations run by volunteers have operated in every state for quite a long time and we only became a national organisation in 2016. We work on behalf of our members to advocate for the proper funding of the ABC and for it to remain independent, free from political and commercial pressures. Quentin has wonderfully explained the importance of, a, of the ABC and what he has said today. A well-funded, independent ABC is critical for Australia's democracy and a strong membership helps us to do our work to protect the ABC. You can join your state's organisation at our ABC Friends national website, www.abcfriends.org.au. Thank you.